Well, welcome everyone. We are live at the Founders Tavern here at the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum. We, uh, we welcome you to our third Sunday of the month lecture for the month of May. Today's talk is entitled Ethan Allen, Boone, Crockett, and other contemporary frontiersmen. And our speaker is Don Miller, as I said, who was sitting right next to me here. Before we begin, I would like to uh, thank our, the following businesses for their financial support. AARP Vermont, Vermont Humanities, BurlingtonCars.com, 802 Cars, and Home Light Investment. So just a few words about our speaker. Don Miller is an active student of history, past president of the Bennington Historical Society, and currently a board member of the Vermont Historical Society. His presentation today will focus on three well-known folk heroes. What do these contemporaries have in common? How are they different? What role does Alan, our folk hero, play in our Vermont story? And by the way, there will be a question and answer period at the end of this talk. So please uh, participate. And at this time, I will turn this over to our speaker, Don. Yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll expand the uh, title a little bit, be more complete. Ethan Allen, folks, uh, frontiersman, folk hero, Daniel Boone, Davy Crockett, and other contemporaries. <clears throat> My intent is to uh, look at these people in, in the light of real people. I, I don't think we give Ethan Allen enough credit. I think he deserves a lot of credit and I think he can hold his own with the Daniel Boone, the Davy Crockett's. And I'd like to see us do a better job in the state of Vermont of promoting him. You know, that's where I come from. Frontiersmen, folk hero, contemporaries. Frontiersmen first. I define that as somebody who's born and raised in one or more states, then moves to a state that is under development that has not been a state. It's, it's one of those no, no supermarkets, no Home Depots, you're on your own. Uh, folk hero, these are real people, not Paul Bunyan. These are people who went into those frontiers made decisions, they weren't always right, they weren't always great decisions, but they were real people. And, and sometimes their actions got exaggerated for good or for bad, but they were folk, they're folk heroes and we ought to appreciate them for what they did for us. Contemporaries, that's a tough one uh, for, for Crockett. Allen moved to Vermont in like 1760s and Vermont became the 14th state in 1791. Kentucky became a state in 1792, Tennessee in 96, and Ohio in 1803. So, the, and these three states had their own frontiersmen. Uh, Daniel Boone from Kentucky, Davy Crockett from Tennessee and Simon Kenton, uh, which I hope to be able to get to at the end. Uh, and, and they're all, they all became states within a 12 year period. This was quick. None of them were colonies. They're all developed from the frontier. Crockett, he's the most problematic by my definitions, but he's probably the best known example of a frontiersman we have. According to Walt Disney, let me quote, Davy Crockett was born on a mountaintop in Tennessee, green estate in the land of the free, raised in the woods so he knew every tree, killed him a bar or bear when he was only three. Davy Crockett, Davy Crockett, king of the wild frontier. Well, I, I think that's a slight exaggeration. Uh, born on a mountaintop in Tennessee? No, he was born in North Carolina in a part of North Carolina that became Tennessee. So he doesn't meet my definition of 
being some, born somewhere else and then moving in to an undeveloped territory. In fact, when he was 10 years old, Tennessee became a state. He was born in eight, eight, uh, 1786 and Tennessee achieved statehood in 1796. So he was, he, he grew up in what was a state. Doesn't meet my definition of a frontiersman. But was he wrong? No. Dizzy, that is. Crockett was a frontiersman, perhaps, with regard to Florida, Alabama, and Texas. Florida and Texas both became states 50 years later, 1845. So he was a frontiersman, but not a contemporary. And he's not a contempt, he's not a frontiersman in uh, Tennessee. <clears throat> Maybe we'll have a chance to look at who was. Hmm? So we want to advance. Sure. Um, where are we? Okay, so Boone, let's go back to Boone was, oh boy. Let me get it back. Allen was born in 1734, uh, excuse me, 1738, and, and uh, Boone was born in 1734. So they're only four years apart. Crockett, as I said, was born in 1786, 52 and 50, 48 years later. So he's really a couple of generations behind, but he's still the best known frontiersman. So there's a lot of parallels that we can draw. Crockett was a backwoodsman. Uh, he, but he ran for Congress five times in Tennessee. He won three times, which means two times more people voted against him than voted for him. So he wasn't always popular. And none of these frontiersmen did everything right and were always popular. Crockett was larger than life, like a legend. His maiden speech in Congress gives us a clue. I'm the same David Crockett. Yeah, advance that. Oh. I'm the same David Crockett, fresh from the backwoods, half horse half alligator, a little touched with the snapping turtle, can wade the Mississippi, <clears throat> leap the Ohio, ride upon a streak of lightning, and slip without a scratch down a honey locust, can whip my weight in wildcats, and if any gentleman pleases, for a $10 bill, he may throw in a panther. Hug a bear too close for comfort, and eat any man opposed to Jackson. Well, Crockett clearly bought into the legend and played it for all it was worth. He went on to tell the congressman that the next time he stood up, he would talk straight talk and he wouldn't be talking legend. Um, but that's, that's part of being a folk hero, is the legend that grows around, the stretch of the imagination. Back to Ethan, and I want to draw these parallels. Uh, I believe that Ethan Allen understood the power of legend. As a young man growing up in uh, Connecticut, he took uh, issue with those in authority, whether it be the church or local politicians. By the way, if you notice these two photos, this is Ethan Allen here in front of the state house with the right hand up. And this, this is a picture of Davy Crockett before he goes to Texas, right hand up. And he's, same, pretty much the same pose. I think that's funny that we didn't have photos from the time, but that, they, all, they all must look alike. Uh, uh, talking about Ethan Allen and how he, he didn't, he wasn't afraid to challenge authority. And it just got him into a lot of trouble, some fisticuffs, impromptu wrestling matches. He also found himself in court representing himself and uh, quite often. And, and his view uh, of the law was sometimes very common. For example, his, his understanding of pig law was that one pig pen is good as another. That came about because in, in towns back there in Connecticut, 
if a pig got loose, you're supposed to take him to the town pig pen. Well, Alan found one loose, but he took him to his own pig farm and he got sued. And so he went to court, argued, um, but he lost. He lost a, a number of those battles and he finally left Connecticut. But when he came to Vermont, he was 32 years old and he'd learned the hard lesson about fighting legal battles in someone else's court. He learned to play a different game and to create and play the legend. And here we might refer to the 1970, or excuse me, 1770 ejectment trials, where he was hired by the settlers of the Vermont Grants to defend the Hampshire Grant titles. And he went to New York and he found out that Vermonters don't necessarily get a fair play in New York courts. So he came back and formed the Green Mountain Boys and there he, he, he'd he honed his ability like Crockett to think and to speak on his feet. He crafted the image of a tough talking, tough guy. He was a physically giant man. He was over six, about six foot four, wearing way, well over 200 pounds. While Boone and Crockett, who were both considered big, were only about five eight. So he was quite large and could play the role of a bully uh, with some effect. Not coincidentally, Ethan could outdrink the boys at the tavern. Size is a great advantage when controlling alcohol or the boys. I doubt if he ever lost control. He learned to manipulate crowds and young men. To his credit, he knew how to appeal to the instincts of the Green Mountain Boys and the sheriff's posses. It is significant, I think, that in the five years that he was the leader of the Green Mountain Boys, he nor they ever killed anyone. They did a lot of things, burning, running people off, but never killing. And I think this was a controlled thing. He, he understood escalation, he understood mob, mob psychology, and he wouldn't allow the situation to escalate out of control. And I, I'll give you an example a little bit later. Um, let's see what else I have. Okay, back to back to Crockett, Indian fighter. This may well have been uh, one of the biggest exaggerations. Um, his Indian fighting was a little bit sparse, a little bit exaggerated. He was an Andrew Jackson fan, and in 1802, Jackson was appointed major general of the Tennessee militia. In 1813, which is also referred to in that, the next stanza of that poem, the Creek War e e evolved and Jackson called for some volunteers. Well, Crockett volunteered for a 90 day period. He spent most of his time hunting for the army. He figured his skills were more suited to killing deer and then in confronting Indians. He didn't fight the Indians very much. In a year later, 18, the War of 1812 was on us. Jackson was promoted uh, to a general in the US Army. And again, he called for Tennessee volunteers. This time Crockett volunteered for six months and he went down uh, for three months. He again served more in the capacity of foraging for food than in fighting the Indians. After three months, he went home and hired a young man. Crockett was only 27, I don't think that's very old, but he hired a young man to go back and serve out the remaining three months of his commitment. So I'm, I don't think Ethan Allen would have done that. I, I think he would have taken it all the way. And from there, uh, Crockett became kind of a legislator. He was more of a statesman, backwoodsman perhaps, but he ran for two terms in the state house. And then five times, as I mentioned, he ran for Congress and he, won he got beat two times. Uh, one time uh, he had voted against the Indian Removal Act. That's the, 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 the act that created the Trail of Tears, moving the Indians from Southeastern United States out to Oklahoma. Uh, it, was, it was 
a law that Andrew Jackson favored and supported and promoted. And Crockett was the only member of the Tennessee congressional delegation to vote against it. Jackson was popular in Tennessee and, uh, and Crockett ended up losing that election. Toward the end of uh, that fifth term, it looked like, and Jackson's term in, as president was coming to an end. Uh, Martin Van Buren was the vice president and it looked like he would gain the nomination and the presidency. And that's when uh, Crockett said, if he's gonna become president, I'm going to Texas. And he did. Uh, Martin Van Buren became president and, and Crockett went to Texas. He left in 11, and, and this picture is about that time. He, he, on November 1st of 35, when Crockett was 49 years old, he heads off to Texas, but he stops along the way. He only had three people that started with him. He stopped in Jackson, Mississippi, picked up another 30 people, stopped in Little Rock, Arkansas. They had big parties and big promotions. And, and then finally in January 14th, uh, he ended up in Nacogdoches, Texas, where with 65 men, he, he took an oath to serve the provincial government of Texas for, for six months. The other side of that promise was every volunteer would get 4,600 acres of land. I'm not sure that makes you a volunteer, but before he left, his youngest daughter who was like 13, remembered him leaving in deer skin uh, and with the rifle. And she had the distinct impression that Crockett would be inviting them all, the whole family, down to Texas very soon. Well, that didn't work out very well. They were quite outnumbered at the Battle of uh, the Alamo. He got to the Alamo in, in uh, March, I think it was, and the Battle of Alamo really, really only lasted uh, 90 minutes. I mean, they were there for a long time shooting back and forth, but when, when the final battle came, it, it was quick and everybody was killed. Okay, let's move on to Boone. Boone is much more of a contemporary, much more of a peer. He, uh, he was born in a log cabin in, in, Pen in Pennsylvania near Reading in 1734. In 1750, his family moved to North Carolina when he was only 16. And, and he did the obligatory type things for being a frontiersman who wasn't running away from things. Some people moved out into the frontier to run away, but he didn't. He served in the French and Indian War. At age 20, he was part of one of the first of the expeditions to Fort Duquesne, uh, serving uh, General Braddock was the general. This is the one where Braddock got killed on the way. And it was a terrible, terrible uh, loss. The, the Braddock was buried in the road and covered over so that his body wouldn't be removed and, and uh, mutilated. Uh, that, but Boone's role as a 20 year old, he was a teamster and a blacksmith. So he was way in the background. Another young American, uh, 22 year old George Washington was a colonel in the Virginia militia on that same same venture, so, uh, but, it, but it was a disaster. And then back along the way, the Cherokee uprising in 1758, Boone participated in that. And then 1744, which we'll mention again, uh, Dunmore's war, uh, he participated uh, as, as a messenger. He, the, the, the Dunmore's war was not much of a war. It was like one battle, half-baked battle. And, but that was an important battle out there because it's when the Shawnee gave up their rights to Kentucky 
and the Greek, they, they always viewed Kentucky just as a hunting land and they lived in Ohio, but they agreed to, to stay in Ohio and not to challenge the Kentuckians further after 1774. That didn't really hold that there were still Indians on the prow uh, committing uh, all kinds of problems. Now, during this time period, Boone was uh, in his 20s and he was an active hunter and trapper. That's how he made his living to support his family. He had quite a large family and he supported them by hunting and trapping. This is what you expect of a frontiersman. He actually didn't make his first trips into Kentucky until 1767. And when he went with his brother Squire and then his second uh, third trips were in 68 and 69. The 69 trip, that was a two year trip. He took five, five gentlemen with him and that's what this picture here shows probably. Uh, and, and I think this was the first, first year of Orvis, you know, that they don't have a wide range of garb. They're all dressed the same, right? So anyway, that, I'm sure that's what it was. Now, the, Kentucky developed a little bit slower than Vermont. Vermont was first settled by the Europeans in 1761, you know, David Robinson and Jedediah Dewey down in Bennington, and, and, it, and it developed fairly quickly. Because of the Indians, Kentucky was a little bit slower. We, we had to get, uh, we had the Dun, Dunmore's War in 74, and um, in 75, Richard Henderson bought the Cherokee rights to Kentucky. Henderson didn't have any right to buy them or Cherokee didn't have any right to sell them, but th that's what happened. Things happened that didn't, that weren't quite right, didn't make sense, uh, but they, they were, those were important steps in clearing the way to settlement. So in 1773-ish, uh, Boone was part of the first group of British colonists that settled in Kentucky. He wasn't the leader, but he was one of the, the, the group. And then in 1775, um, he, he, he moved into Kentucky and created uh, Boonesboro about the same time as Harrodsburg right nearby was built. These were dated communities, they were forts. And because of the, even then the, there was still Indian threat and that's, that's what they had to do. And, and it was actually the year or two before that, 1774, that Boone started the um, cutting the, the way through the Wilderness Gap. Uh, I have that. Oh, if you can find the Wilderness Gap, no big deal. Um, and so, so they're they're just moving. They're really starting to move in in '75, and in '76, something interesting happened. There's the Wilderness Gap. And if we go on to the next slide, what happened in 76 was that his daughter and two other girls were captured by the Indians outside of Boonesboro. And Boone followed them, took them two days to catch up and rescue them. It was a, one of the most important stories in Boone legend. And some say, I believe it's probably correct that James Fenimore Cooper Cooper uh, fashioned th that story into the last of the Mohegans. And, you know, the, 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 it's quite a bit different fact line, but nonetheless, he presumably used that as an example and inspiration in writing the book. Now, a couple of years later, and I'm, oh, that's not unusual. Again, drawing parallels, Ethan Allen's family got captured. In Vermont, the bad guys were called Yorkers. And in 1772, his cousin, remember Baker, was, was captured by the Yorkers. They came in in the early morning hours, broke into the house with swords, cut up his wife, cut him up, cut him up took him out. And this was in March. Uh, it, there was snow outside, freezing cold, took him in his night clothes, headed toward Albany. The Green Mountain Boys uh, got right on the trail and in within 24 hours or a little more, they, they caught up and rescued Baker and brought him back. 
So it didn't matter where the frontier was. You either had Indians capturing your family or, or the Yorkers. And I suggest that's one of the places where Ethan Allen showed his, 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 his mettle. He did not escalate. This was continually escalating. You had the ejectment trials. You had the Breckenridge standoff in 71, where they tried to, the Yorkers tried to kick James Breckenridge off his farm. Then the Yorkers put a, a bounty on the heads of the Green Mountain Boys. Remember Baker was one of the captains of the Green Mountain Boys. And they picked Baker to deliver a message. And the, breaking into the house with sword and drawing blood, that was an escalation. Ethan Allen never let it, he could have easily escalated in blood for blood, but he didn't. I believe he put the escalation to, to rest and held it down for the next three or four years while the Green Mountain boys were dealing with the Yorkers. Okay, moving forward. In 1778, Boone led 30 men on a, on a mission to get salt. This is up in the Licking River, uh, north, north part of uh, uh, Kentucky. Uh, getting salt was important for preservation of food and things like that. So he took a work party of 30 some people. While he was out getting meat for the work party, he got captured by Blackfish uh, warriors a large band, much bigger than the 30. And Boone did a couple of things. He said, don't attack my 30 guys. You'll massacre them. We'll give up. We'll surrender. You're, we'll, we'll, you can take us back to Ohio. And then he convinced the Indians not to march on Boonesboro. And he, and he said, we will make them, we will surrender them in the summer. Whoa. So the Indians bought that. These 30 guys were taken captive. Uh, they, they, the, the council, the Shawnee council voted not to uh, kill them, to spare their lives. Daniel Boone ran the gauntlet, which is a traditional type of thing. You know, two lines of Indians a quarter mile long with sticks and, and um, clubs and run the guy down and beat him up. And then he was adopted by the Shawnee. These are two things that happened to others along the way. Then in the summer, this was in January, in the summer of 78, Boone got the wind that, that Black Chief was now ready to attack Boonesboro and he was gonna go forward. Uh, Boone escaped and traveled 160 miles in five days on a horse until the horse collapsed. And then he finished up on foot. And he got there in time to prepare the to prepare Boonesboro and defend. And in September, Blackfish came and there was a 10 day siege and, and, and that was repelled. So he saved Boonesboro but some of the men were not happy. Ben Logan and Richard Callahan, names that you see in Ohio history uh, and Kentucky history, they, they thought that Boone enjoyed the Shawnee too much, that he'd been a traitor, that he shouldn't have given up the men and, and offered to surrender Boonesboro. And so they brought a court martial against Boone. Boone was found innocent, but the point is he was heavily criticized and considered a traitor by some. And, and I would draw another parallel. If you think of the Halderman negotiations where, um, you know, how do we describe that real quick? Allen had been captive and by the by the uh, British, but released in '78. So that it's a little bit off in time, but the, the you know, idea is the same. The, every year, they the people went to Philadelphia to become a part of and gain acceptance with the Con Continental Congress. New York put.
put the, the veto to that every time. New York considered Vermont part of New York. They would not give in and allow Vermont to become an independent state, which is what led to Vermont becoming an independent republic in 1777, which it was until 1791. And, but during that time, the Vermont people felt threatened by New York governor with troops. Uh, they, they felt threatened by the British who might come back down the Saratoga uh, area and, and come in. And so they were becoming more and more isolated and they need, not only were they threatened, they needed trade partners. And so the idea of perhaps developing trade with Britain and some thought of rejoining the British empire. And this didn't go well, obviously with a lot of people who were critical of what Ethan Allen was doing. And it, it was not well known at the time. There's more, a lot of been written about it, a lot of speculation, no one knows. My point is that the frontiersmen made decisions and they had to make fast decisions and the decisions weren't always right. What do we know? Maybe Ethan Allen was hoping that by threatening mildly or however, going back to England, that maybe Congress would give in and let them become members of the Continental Congress or who knows. Uh, I, I, and I suspect that it was really just negotiation and positioning in when uh, Cornwallis lost in 1781 at uh, Jamestown, then the whole idea of getting back together with England was put on the back burner. And I think that's a clue, uh, not definitively, but a clue that Allen was just using it as a negotiating tool with Congress. Okay, moving along. Uh, Finishing up Boone, he was quite of a land speculator. You know, after this time period, he, he, a lot of the land deals he made went sour. He, at one point he was doing quite well. He had seven slaves. He, he was a militia colonel, a sheriff, a county coroner, and even elected to the Virginia State Assembly before Kentucky was made a state in 1792. So, he was in great favor for a lot, long time, but he was losing his eyesight and, and other things. And eventually all of this financial world fell up, started falling around his ears. And in 1799, he moved to Missouri where he lived the last 20 years of his life. And, and, and he always promised or hoped that he could pay off his debts, but he never fully paid off all the debts he had back in Kentucky. So uh, the rise and fall of our heroes. Okay? Now, let me move forward to Simon Kenton. Let's see if we get another picture. This is Simon Kenton. He's from Ohio and he is a, a contemporary. He was, born in 1755 in Virginia. So he, he's like 17 years younger than Ethan Allen, but he got to Kentucky in 1771 at, a, at the age of 16. Why? Well, he, he was kind of running away. I mentioned some people ran away. He got into a fight with an older gentleman over a girl who went to a dance or something. It was a knockdown drag out fight. And when, uh, Kenton woke up, he couldn't find the guy, thought he killed him. So he got scared and ran to Kentucky from, uh, I, I think he was living in Virginia at the time. Um, 16 years old with, with carrying nothing but what he had on, on his back. He got a temporary job, got a rifle, got a little grub stake and then went on to Kentucky in 1771. This was early in Kentucky's development. And he pretty much spent most of his time by himself along the Northern edge of Kentucky, along the Ohio River, 
where if other people coming down the Ohio River, he would serve as a scout or a guide and say, well, don't go to Ohio, that's bad. Come over here in Kentucky, hide here, whatever. And in 1775, once Boonesboro was set up, he actually went and lived in Boonesboro for a while and befriended Daniel Boone. He, and in fact, in 1775, he is credited with saving Boone's life. Boone and he were outside the, the gates, outside the fence, and they were attacked by Indians. Boone was shot in the ankle. An Indian was hovering over him, ready to scalp him. And Simon Kenton came up, shot the Indian, clubbed another one, picked up Daniel Boone, and then dodging and darting, carried him back into the, into the fort. Kenton was a big guy. He was about as big as uh, Ethan Allen, six foot three, four, well over 200 pounds. So he was a huge giant of a man. He, all the Indians respect him for his fighting, his riflemanship. He might've been the best technical frontiersman of the group uh, in terms of skills, hunting uh, and the, the fighting. And he himself in 1788 was captured by the Indians just like Boone and he had to run the gauntlet. But because he was such a, such a famous white man, a, a, a spur in the, in the side of the Indians, they, they took them around to nine Indian villages and made him run the gauntlet in every one. He had to run the gauntlet nine times. Even Boone only had to run it once. And he ended up with some broken bones and things like that, but he survived, uh, quite remarkably. And he was later adopted. He was soon adopted as well, like Boone. He was adopted by the Indians. And then later on, um, he, he was exchanged in Detroit on a prisoner exchange. Okay, so during this time period, he, be, he got to see Ohio. And uh, Ohio itself was a later, even later than Kentucky to develop. In, in large part because of those Indians, uh, the Shawnee and others, uh, the Indians question didn't really get settled until like 1794 when Mad Anthony Wayne uh, beat a large group of Indians at the Battle of Fallen Timbers. And then in 1795, the Treaty of Greenville was signed by virtually all the major Indian groups and uh, Greenville was on the Indiana Ohio border, 1795. And so after that, it was deemed safe to settle in Ohio. And Kenton was one of the first to take his family and, and uh, settle in Ohio. So, and, and he did one of the things he should have known better. He, he bought a huge amount of land from the Indians. The Indians didn't own it. They knew they didn't own it. Kenton didn't have the right to buy it, just like Henderson and others in Kentucky. He was a laughing stock from the get-go. However much he paid, bank probably pretty much bankrupt. But the part of Ohio he settled, you know, Columbus is in the middle of the state. Dayton is about halfway to Indianapolis. In between Dayton and Columbus is where Springfield, Ohio, and Urbana, Ohio. And that's, that's the general area that Kenton d lived in. There's a town named Kenton uh, near there. And today, he's, he's a big name. The, the Boy Scout Council is named uh, after him, the Simon Kenton Boy Scout Council. So, uh, where's that thing? Uh, one, one, one quickie story, I think. Uh, to show his character, that he was different. Uh, he, his nemesis, the big Indian chief was uh, Tecumseh. Tecumseh was at the Treaty of Greenville, but he was a young buck and he didn't want to go along. And so T Tecumseh was the last Indian to raise a huge confederation of other tribes. He tried to recruit Indians all the way down to Georgia, Florida, 
and his, his headquarters was up on the Tippy Canoe River at Prophet Town. His brother was the prophet and he took care of the town while Tecumseh was away. When Tecumseh left Prophet Town, he said, don't, don't engage William Tecumseh. Um, don't wait, uh, Henry Harrison, uh, don't engage him in war. Harrison was the governor, the military governor of Indiana. The prophet messed up. They got into a war. Harrison wiped out Tippy Canoe Village uh, and that put an end really to Tecumseh's uh, confederation. That was 1811. Uh, a year later in the War of 1812, Tecumseh supported the British in a battle up at the Battle of Thames up near Toronto. Uh, Tecumseh was killed on the battlefield. Simon Kenton at the age of 57 was a scout and a militia leader for the Patriots. When Tecumseh was killed, the two respected each other. They asked Kenton to go out and identify Tecumseh. Well, he went out and Tecumseh had taken off all of his chief stuff so he looked like a regular warrior except he was big and you know Kenton looked at the, the battlefield and he spotted Tecumseh and then he spotted chief round chief over here with chief Starbon and he said okay men there is Tecumseh and so the people mutilated the body of the round uh, the other Indian and, and Tecumseh was not mutilated. So Tecumseh and Kenton both stood up for treating the enemy right. You don't mutilate dead people. You don't humiliate your captives. And that night, the Shawnee came in, removed Tecumseh from the battlefield and gave him a decent burial. Nobody knows where today. Okay, I'm gonna move real quick now. So that we've gone through Boone, Crockett, Kenton, and Kenton and Boone were the real contemporary frontiersmen to Allen. So, so in Tennessee, what was there? There wasn't any one person, but if we go to James Robertson, next slide, um, this is a good looking young man, he's, he's only, he was born in 1742, so he's only four years younger than Ethan Allen. And he, he was born in Virginia, moved to North Carolina, so he fits the definition of frontiersman. He had limited education, but he was great at tracking and hunting animals, what you expect of a frontiersman. And his claim to fame, well, he was on the third trip with Boone into Kentucky, so, so he was part of that frontiersman uh, attitude. Um, his claim to fame, next, next slide, is that he helped found Nashville, Tennessee. In 1799, he led 100 men overland from Knoxville, 100 miles due west to the site of Nashville and built Fort Nashboro. That, that took a while. There was a hundred miles over land, pretty much flat land. It was too tough a trip for women and children. So what they do? They put the women and children on boats in January and rafts, and they got stuck in the ice for two months. Now this is the Tennessee River, and if you imagine Tennessee is a, a long, thin state, 400 miles up on to the top, 350 on the bottom. Memphis, north, south on the river, and over in the east, you've got Knoxville coming down on an angle to Chattanooga, right? It's about 100 miles to Chattanooga and another 100 miles up to Nashville at the triangle, 120 by 100, 100, all right? The Tennessee River goes down to Chattanooga, across uh, Alabama, Muscle Shoals, to Tupelo, Mississippi, then it goes up north through Tennessee, in, through Kentucky, and dumps into the Ohio River above Paducah. There, the river is coming down to the Mississippi, the Ohio, right? 
So they've got to pull or sail, you can't paddle upstream, up the Ohio River about 50 miles to get to the, to the mouth of the Cumberland River, which goes to Nashville. Well, then it's like 150 miles upstream there. So a year and a quarter later, the women show up, some of them, and I'm, there was no telegraph, no telephone, there's no communication. I don't know if the men ever expected them to show up, but they got stuck in the ice for two months. They got attacked by Indians. They got smallpox and it took a year and a quarter. But remember, 120 miles across flat land was too tough for the women. So that's his claim to fame. Next, next photo, the next photo actually shows the, the guy who was with the women was John Donaldson. If you're in Nashville, uh, Donaldsonville is uh, Donaldson is uh, northwest or northeast of uh, Columbus or Nashville. So that's the real. That's I'm going to uh, mention one other. That's the real frontiersman in the group. But he didn't do anything spectacular enough to be well known enough to compete with Boone or Ethan Allen, or even Simon Kenton. That was his one claim to fame. Um, the, the last guy I want to mention from Tennessee is uh, Jack Severe or John Severe, and he's up there next. He was more of a military man, more of a Tom um, Chittenden uh, type. He was born in uh, 45, so he's still in the right age group. And he was a frontiersman in that he was born in Vermont, uh, Virginia and moved to East Tennessee. So he moved, he went in, but he spent a lot of time in the military, uh, not really on the frontier, there's a support group when you're in the military. And he was involved with things like uh, uh, the Cherokee, Cherokee Lord Dunman's War and, and the American Revolution. He served in the American Revolution. And then after the war in 1784, the settlers there revolted against North Carolina. Again, it was not a state yet, so Tennessee, the western part of Tennessee, uh, North Carolina was what became Tennessee. He led a revolt and created a separate state of, of Franklin. Like Vermont created a republic, right? That lasted for 17 years. So down there, they created a state that collapsed after six years, after four years. And this guy was the first governor, the only governor of the state of Franklin. And, and people got so mad at him, he fled after four years. Well, in 1790, when the state of Franklin was totally dissolved, North Carolina gave to, to the federal government the land of Tennessee, un, unincorporated. And this guy led the settlement of Tennessee and became the first governor of Tennessee for 12 out of the first 14 years. 1796, he became governor and for 12 out of the next 14 years he served as governor before going into congress and he served in congress about five years and then died so that's every state was a little bit different and so this is a big guy but nobody really cares about him today he's, there's a town in east tennessee named Sevierville, and you know, and that's known as the birthplace of dolly Parton. So, I mean, that, that's the best he could do. So uh, I, I think with that, let me kind of conclude by saying again, my theme is to say that Ethan Allen could hold his own with Daniel Boone, Crockett, Simon Kenton, they were all different. They all were into new, new country, making decisions. And what they did, if they didn't do it, wouldn't they, when would they have come states? The statehood was in part dependent upon the frontiersmen to go and clear the land and establish uh, communities where there weren't any. And I think we should do more to promote Ethan Allen uh, in the same light that Boone, Crockett, and in Ohio, uh, Kenton gets a lot of recognition. So I will take uh, questions at this point. I crammed a lot okay. in. So feel free if you are here in 
the room with us, obviously you can ask a question or down. If you want to ask a question uh, and you're watching on Zoom, please make sure you unmute yourself and uh, we would certainly like to hear from you. So no. we'll start with the question right here at, at, in the tavern. You're from Benny. Yes. Alan, is that tavern stores? We'll repeat the question. Where Ethan Allen sat there and discussed the back and forth type thing. Right. Question is uh, in Bennington, there was a famous tavern which was at headquarters for the Green Mountain Boys. And, and that tavern is what's called the Catamount Tavern, Phase Tavern, different things, Green Mountain Tavern. It, it, the question is, is it still there? No, there's a marker. There's a, there's a house set back off the foundation. Uh, but that, that indeed is a very, very well, well known place in Bennington. Not only was it the headquarters for the Green Mountain Boys, and as you mentioned, it's where the Green Mountain Boys or Ethan Allen planned the attack on Fort Ticonderoga. Uh, oh, I missed I missed a story uh, about about that. Um, the first what first first victory true uh it was actually uh, it got ethan allen into a little bit of trouble talk he got in trouble because the Con first continental congress that met in 74 and adjourned in november i guess it was the last thing they did is said well things are a little bit rough but don't anybody attack at the british well you fast forward in in spring of 75 he had conquered in Lexington, that things changed a little bit. Uh, he, Ethan Allen wasn't the only one thinking about it. Massachusetts uh, and Connecticut legislatures and governors were thinking about it. Uh, Benedict Arnold was authorized by the Massachusetts to, to lead a group, uh, but Ethan Allen is the one who actually did it. And that was the first victory. After the victory, the, Allen got a very nasty letter from Second Continental Congress, which met on the same day, May, May 10th was the first day of Second Continental Congress, the same day that they stormed Fort Ticonderoga. Um, he got a nasty letter from Congress saying, what do you do? Be prepared to give it all back. He went, he went down with Seth Warner to Philadelphia, to the Capitol arrived in June and a couple of things that happened in the meantime, Battle of Bunker Hill and George Washington was named the commander in chief of an army that didn't exist. And so by the time he got down there to tell the story, Congress's attitude had actually changed. So the story I meant to, I missed was, let's see, uh, Crockett, you can wonder about his military judgment of going to uh, the Alamo. Well, did circum I think circumstances, circum you couldn't always predict the circumstances. It changed. It was a, they were hugely outnumbered. Did he really believe that he would become a hero, you know, save the Alamo? I don't know. It became obvious he couldn't. Did he really think he was going to come back or bring his family to Texas? I don't know. I'd ask the same question of Ethan Allen when he made the military misjudgment of attacking or getting ready to attack Montreal after Ticonderoga. General Montgomery was headed up there, the Northern Army of the uh, Continental Forces headed up and he employed Allen to be a scout, go scout and, and recruit men to fight on our side. So he recruited like 200 people. Uh, Canadians, but Montgomery got stuck at Fort John on the River, River, River. and the, the, the 200 Canadians must have been wondering, are you kidding me? Is anybody coming? Is this really going to How long can you hold 200 people 
off their homeland as a group waiting to attack. Besides that, and this is a lot of, I think, mystery or unknown or hard, he may have expected 200 other men from John Brown to participate, and he may have expected 500 men from inside Montreal. That would give him a total of about um, 900 or 1,000 people to attack Montreal, which was only defended by 100 people. That's yeah, 10 times as many people as he had working for him at Fort Ticonderoga, defended by only two times as much. So the numbers arguably, if they were right, were on his side. So was it foolishness or uh, were some of that misinformation? Was the circumstances change? He ended up being cap captured with 30, same number as Daniel Boone got captured by the Indians at the Lick. You know, again, the parallels are amazing. So he, he, when, when the people got wind of the fact that Ethan Allen was there with, and, and they came out of Montreal and it, the Canadians disappeared very quickly. It left Ethan Allen standing with 34 men on the bank of a river that they weren't gonna cross and they were captured. So again, another parallel and question was it military misjudgment or did circumstances change? I won't answer that. I, okay, another <laughs> another question? I'll ask you one. I, I, growing up, I think we knew uh, or heard and admired Davy Crockett more than any of the other people you mentioned. I'm wondering if part of that was uh, due to the fact that Crockett's the only one who died in battle. Of the, of the six that you mentioned, um, you or know, also was it Walt Disney? Boone, Boone, okay. Boone lived until 1920, and huh? Hollywood. 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 Yeah. The, the quick answer to the yeah. question is, yeah, absolutely. It was Walt Disney and made made Crockett very famous with that ditty, and uh, you know, when we were all young, we had coonskin caps and, and rifles, and we were Crockett type then, yeah. and 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 a lot of that, and it was the it wasn't totally Disney. In 1831, there was a biography of, of Crockett that, you know, went overboard with the legend and exaggerated. And, and But that's what happens with heroes sometimes. The stories stretch and sometimes they go beyond reality. And, and that's okay. But we ought to look at the people as real people with faults, what and then figure out what did they do and where would they be without them? Uh, Alan arguably was didn't, very, very critical in the entire development of, of Vermont, even though he was active only from like, let's say 1770 when he defended the Hampshire grants with the uh, ejectment trials up till what he died in like 1789 was it? So you know, that's 17 years, and he was he was not the big kingpin of the republic. Thomas Chittenden was really the boss, uh, but he was there. And I, I don't think you can underestimate the control that he brought to the 1770, 1775 period until the attack on Fort Ticonderoga. Up until then, the Green Mountain Boys set the tone, and I'd say, Ethan Allen prevented it from escalating to bloodshed. He had a he had a, a way of scaring people off. And somebody said, oh, the sheriff was scared to death of him. Well, wait a minute. If the sheriff isn't scared to death of him, it ain't gonna be effective. To be a really good bully, you have to be convincing. Well, it might have been criticized for just taking the Right. The point that and we're probably at the end, but yeah. the, the final point raised here, a uh, good point. Another important part of Fort Ticonderoga was the capturing of the cannon, which was part of the planning going in. But it was General Knox who took it wasn't those. He was what? Bookseller in Boston. Oh, a bookseller. Okay, at that point, he was not a general. Knoxville, Tennessee, Fort Knox. 
Right, right, right. But he he's the one that took the cannon from Ticonderoga, took it down somewhere along, like in where- In the middle of the winter, the oxen- the Yeah, in the middle of the winter, on oxen, across the Berkshires, amazing. And when they delivered those cannon onto Dorchester Heights, uh, and Washington was there, perimeter was covered, uh, they were looking down on, on Boston, and that's when the, the Redcoats evacuated they chased them Boston. Out of, chased them out of Boston. Yeah, so, and, and, and in Boston today, Evacuation Day is still celebrated, probably the only place it is, but that was because of Fort Ticonderoga. Don't forget. All right, thank you, Donald. I think we're not going to take a vote as to who is our favorite uh, frontiersman, but I would put in a, a plug for Ethan Allen in terms of his writings. I don't believe these other five people wrote anything as interesting as Ethan's narrative or his uh, reason, the only oracle of man. So if you haven't read those, I would encourage you to do that. We do have them commercial, commercial. We do have them here at the Ethan Allen Homestead for sale. So, right. uh, so thank you for uh, joining us. For those of you that are live, this is be being recorded and other folks will be able to watch this program at, at a future time. Uh, we are still planning our uh, talk for next month. We have a couple of people who are in line and we are just uh, going to finalize the dates with those. But uh, again, it will be the third Sunday of the month in June. If you are not a member of the Ethan Allen Homestead, I would suggest you consider joining us. Uh, go on to the website and all the information there is on how you can become a member of the Ethan Allen Homestead. So thank you for joining us and thank you, Don. For Don came all the way up from Bennington to uh, be with us today So and his wife. So we appreciate their, their visit with us today. So take care, folks. Goodbye.